Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our special guest is a man whose remarkable story will be prominently featured in an upcoming film starring Jessica Chastain, Andrew Garfield, and Vincent D'Onofrio called The Eyes of Tammy Faye, about TV evangelists Tammy Faye Baker and her husband Jim Baker. Our guest, who was diagnosed with AIDS in the early 80s, gave a groundbreaking interview in 1985 on Tammy Faye Baker's TV show to dispel the myths surrounding homosexuality, HIV, and AIDS. That historic interview, which shook the religious world to its core, was a monumental turning point in public education and acceptance about being gay and about AIDS, especially for the Christian community. It's been 36 years since then, and our guest has miraculously defied all the odds and is not only still alive, but doing fabulously well. He is Reverend Stephen Peters, and I'm delighted to welcome him to our show. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Harvey. I'm delighted to be here. Steve, prior to becoming ill in 1982, you were openly gay and you were a pastor at the Metropolitan Community Church. And since then, you've been a chaplain and an AIDS activist, correct? Correct. Yes. I was, an, I was a gay activist from about the time, 1976, 77. Uh, so, yeah, it's a long history. <laughs> and then in 1982, you first became ill, and eventually in 1984, you were diagnosed with full-blown AIDS and given eight months to live. Some people say you're a walking miracle. The doctors say you're an anomaly. Can you tell us about your experience with HIV and AIDS? Well, sure. I started getting sick in 1982, and they diagnosed me with GRID, the gay-related immunodeficiency. And then they changed that to ARC as I continued to be terribly ill with hepatitis and CMV and mononucleosis, pneumonia, herpes, shingles, a variety of horrible fungal infections. Like the, one of the infections I had was on the bottom of my right foot. And a dermatologist told me that he hadn't seen it since being in the South Pacific in World War II, and that it was a, a fungal infection associated with walking barefoot in sheep dung in New Zealand. So I <laughs> had never having been in New Zealand or walking through sheep dung. I was quite amazed, but a lot of people with AIDS were getting that kind of strange illnesses happening to them when our immune systems broke down. So I was very sick for two years until they diagnosed me with stage four lymphoma and Kaposi's sarcoma. And the, the narrow definition of AIDS at the time uh, required that you be diagnosed with one of five illnesses and Kaposi's sarcoma is what finally qualified me. And that's when they gave me eight months to live. You were the first patient to be put on Suramin, which was an experimental drug, and it was so toxic that it killed many people and had to be discontinued. As yeah. I understand it, you are one of only two people who survived that drug. Is that right? That's very right, Harvey. Yes. There were about 90 people on the drug around the U.S. I don't know about in Canada, but in the U.S. there were 90 people on the drug. It killed a large percentage of them. And Almost everybody else died within a year or two from the complications of AIDS. The only other survivor is someone who only took it for four weeks and he saw what, what was happening and got off the drug. I took it for 39 weeks and it very nearly killed me. Now you got sick again in 2007 and you were at death's door in 2012 with pancreatitis. But yes. I understand that since then you've been doing well. How is your health now, Steve? Oh, I'm doing fine. I, uh, you know, I have typical things happening to those of us who are in our late 60s. I'm about to turn 69. By the time this airs, I will be 69. And I am just delighted to be as healthy as I am. I have no HIV-related illnesses. I have some of the accelerated aging process that some people think is caused by HIV and some of the side effects of the drugs that keep all of us alive, the, the, keep, uh, the disease at bay, like lipodystrophy and lipoatrophy and neuropathy and things like that. But you know, those are things I can live with and I'm doing fine. I'm still dancing, I'm still carrying on and you know, living a full life. I sing with the Gay Men's Chorus of Los Angeles. 
and I love singing with them and performing. I'm so glad you feel well. Steve, I'm a 64-year-old gay man, and I lived through the worst of the AIDS epidemic. I lost at least half of my friends in the 80s and early 90s. It truly is a miracle that you're still here. How do you account for it? Well, I'm not really sure, to tell you the truth, bottom line. I mean, yes, it could be that I, it's a miracle and that God blessed me with that miracle. I worked very hard at getting well. I, the, my doctor told me when she told me I had stage four lymphoma and KS and AIDS, she said, there are no 100% in medicine. And if one in a million people are going to survive this, why not believe that you are that one in a million and act accordingly? And so I created my own wellness program from studying people who'd beaten cancers they weren't supposed to beat. And I was lucky to get on the serum and treatment and being the first patient, uh, perhaps it was naivete, but uh, it worked within six weeks. My KS lesions and my lymphoma were in complete remission. Well, you did a lot. I understand you engaged in heavy duty prayer, meditation, you listened to healing tapes, healthy eating, vitamins, acupuncture, and the best one that I loved, you had laughter therapy. You watched yeah. I Love Lucy religiously. Yes, it's true. The night I was diagnosed as terminal, they, I had a group of friends over and after we finished crying, uh, we watched the Vitamin of Edgman episode of I Love Lucy over and over again. It was so much fun. Yes. And, uh, and my doctor told me to take it like a medicine and do it every day, two or three times a day. So I, I am did. a huge Lucy fan and I know that that must have had something to do with your miraculous uh, recovery. You know, I got to thank her. I met her at an AIDS benefit at which her daughter, Lucy Arnaz, was singing. And I happened to be seated right behind her. So at the intermission, I got up and I said hello to her and I thanked her for helping me laugh my way through AIDS. And she said, oh, you got that idea from Norman Cousins. And I said, yeah, but you're the one who made me laugh. And she said, well, you're very sweet. And she introduced me to another guy, uh, another person with AIDS who had told her much the same thing. And uh, do you know each other? You both have AIDS. You know? <laughs> and I, I did, but, uh, but we laughed and it was so much fun to meet her. And two months later, she was gone. So I'm, I'm really grateful I got a chance to thank her and meet her in person. Well, Steve, I think that what you went through teaches us that when a doctor says you have no chance of survival, it's never 100% for sure, because medical science does not have all the answers, does it? They do not. Absolutely not. And if a doctor tells you there's no chance of survival, go to another doctor, get a second opinion, because I was so fortunate to find a doctor who believed in the possibility of my getting well in spite of everything that was run, stacked against me. There's a video on YouTube of you singing a song you wrote called, I am the very model of a medical anomaly. Is there <laughs> any chance I could get you to sing it for us? Oh my God. Oh, all right. Well, I, I have to tell you that I wrote the lyrics to this song based on a Gilbert and Sullivan song that when uh, I was sitting there pondering all these people in church are calling me a miracle. All these people in, in the medical world are calling me an anomaly. And so out popped the lyrics to these songs. I wrote, it, wrote them down in like 20 minutes. You know. So here it goes. I am the very model of a medical anomaly. I've had KS lymphoma, hepatitis, thrush, and CMV, bacterial pneumonia, and adrenal insufficiency, all this and more because I caught a virus that's called HIV. And then I took an antiviral just like chemotherapy. It made me sick. My hair fell out. I suffered neurologically. But hey, it worked. It stopped all of the HIV activity. My lymphoma's in remission, and there is no more KS to see. Lymphoma's in remission, and there is no more KS to see. Lymphoma's in remission, and there is no more KS to see. Lymphoma's in remission, and there is no more KS to to see. Now many years have passed and I'm as healthy as a horse can be. It's certainly a miracle for anyone with faith to see. But still in journals medical, in science and oncology, I am the very model of a medical anomaly. I loved it. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you for doing that, Steve. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Any opportunity to perform. <laughs> now, in, in 1985, you were interviewed by Tammy Faye Baker on her TV show, Tammy's House Party. I watched the interview on YouTube, and I have to tell you, I was blown away by her compassion and her sincerity. In fact, I cried through a lot of it. Were you surprised by how she dealt with you? I was, yeah. It was a very, I, I met a very compassionate, loving, supportive, caring person when I did that interview. She was just great. And I, I knew even before we started, when we first talked over that earpiece that kept falling out, uh, we talked for about three minutes before the interview. and. And I knew right away that it was going to be fine. It was, you know, some of the questions she asked were surprising. And, and fortunately, I'd been on many TV shows and argued with many conservative Christians or explained to many conservative Christians about homosexuality and the Bible and that sort of thing. So I was prepared for it, but, but it's still just, there were moments where I was flabbergasted at what she asked. Like when she asked if, if I'd ever had a sexual relationship with a woman. Nobody had ever asked me that before. <laughs> and so I, was, uh, I said, no, I'm, I feel it would be disrespectful of the woman. And, and I have since been told that that was a real sign of the Holy Spirit being present in that interview because I had never said anything like that before. Uh, it just popped out. I think you answered her questions beautifully. And I also think that in those days, and those of us who lived through those days, we understand where those questions were coming from. They were coming from someone who had never talked to someone who was openly gay. And these are questions that people, I certainly got those questions when I told people that I was gay back in the 80s. Oh, I'm sure you did, yeah. Now, yeah. if anyone has not seen Steve's interview with Tammy Faye Baker, you should definitely go to YouTube and watch it. We will yeah. put the link on the screen now. It's really quite moving, and it totally changed my opinion of Tammy Faye Baker. Steve, how did the interview come about? Well, she was looking for somebody to interview, somebody with AIDS, a gay man with AIDS. And her producer had looked all over the Southeast and the East Coast and had not been able to find anybody willing to go on and talk with her about it. So they finally called AIDS Project Atlanta or AID Atlanta. And the executive director there uh, took the call and he was a friend of mine, and uh, Reverend Ken South. And, and he, he referred them to me and said, I think I have somebody who would be just perfect for this. So they called me and and... They were going to fly me first class to North Carolina, Charlotte, and uh, they sent me two tickets because that was in the midst of doing the sermon treatment. And I was very weak and not very well. Uh, I had just come off of a near-death experience where my adrenal glands failed and they didn't detect it until it was almost too late. So they sent me these two first class tickets and then just as we were headed out the door, the producer called and said, send back the tickets, Tammy's sick, we're, we have to cancel the interview. So I thought I was very disappointed, as was my companion. We were both looking forward to seeing Heritage Village and meeting Tammy and maybe Jim too. So the next day, her producer called me back again and said, Tammy's feeling better and we think that it'd be great if you did a satellite hookup interview. We've never done one on PTL network. So this would be our first and you can go to a TV station near you and, and do the, the conversation from there. So that's how it happened. How courageous was it of her to interview you and express such sympathy and support back in 1985? It was extraordinarily courageous. And as, as you will see in the film, she got in a lot of trouble for it. I heard like the next week that she had been reprimanded for it to the point where she was being forced to interview a, a Christian psychotherapist or psychiatrist who converted gays to, to uh, heterosexuality. And then they were more liable to be healed from their AIDS if they were Christian and heterosexual. You know, I, 
I met her son, Jay Baker, about a year and a half ago, or just before the COVID lockdown happened. And he was thrilled to find me because he, uh, he told me that the interview changed not only his mother significantly, but it changed the whole family, that she started taking uh, Jay and his sister, Tammy Sue, to um, MCC services. She started taking them to gay pride events. She took them to hospitals and hospices to visit people with AIDS. Jay was 10. And the fact that she gave such an affirming interview of a gay man with AIDS told him as he got older that he could be who he was and that his mother would love him. And that was a very, it was a huge thing in his life. And so, that's because of you, Steve. Well, you know, me and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, when I was listening to you answer her questions about whether you would ever want to get married and have children, I kept thinking to myself, look how far we've come since 1985. Just think about how different your answers would be to those questions today. Oh, boy, that's true, isn't it? Yes, yes. So many gay men and lesbians are adopting children or having children. And I, I have so many gay and lesbian friends who have children. Some of, some of their children are all grown up now. And so it's, it's really quite common for gay men and lesbians to have children. Uh, not at all unusual as it was back then. Steve, I have to tell you that when you explained to Tammy Faye how God touched you in your moments of darkest despair after being diagnosed with AIDS, that was an incredibly powerful moment. Did you have any idea at that time how monumental this interview would turn out to be? Oh, no, not at all. I came home from the interview and I told my next door neighbor and, and good friend Lucia that I'd done a terrible job and it, I wasn't very effective and I stumbled over my answers and I should have said that and I shouldn't have said this. And, and oh my God, I was so glad I told Lucia. I was, I'm so glad nobody I know will ever see it. Yeah. <laughs> but when, when you watch that interview now, and I assume you have seen it, what do you think of yourself now about how you dealt with it? Well, now I look at it and I realize the, the amazing nature of the whole interview, her treatment of me as a gay man with AIDS, but also my ability to, I think, reach out to her and take care of her feelings as she became emotional and dealt, was dealing with things. And so it's, it, it was... You know, looking back on it now, I've watched it a couple times recently, just to, because of doing interviews like this, and I'm kind of amazed at how graceful the whole interview was, how grace-filled the whole interview was. Uh, and I have had so many people, Harvey, so many people have come up to me uh, in recent years and told me that that interview changed their lives or it saved their lives. I had one fellow sit down next to me at a restaurant and he, he said, I saw your interview 30 years ago and I was 12 and dealing with my sexuality and I was convinced that I would have to commit suicide. And I saw your interview and I realized I could be a gay Christian and I didn't think about suicide ever after. So... You know, I think you deserve a lot of credit for being so open and so warm, so sincere. Did you keep in touch with Tammy Faye Baker after the interview? <laughs> well, you know, she gives, uh, she gave, she said, you have our phone number now. So call if you ever need to reach out and, you know, feel a caring arm or a caring prayer or anything. But it, she gave me the, the prayer line. You know, and so, yes, it was nice to have that, but I, I did not ever meet her in person. And we exchanged hellos through a mutual friend 
from time to time, especially when she was living out here in Palm Springs. I knew a couple of people who knew her. And, and uh, so we would say hello back and forth and how you doing and all of that. But no, I never got to meet her. And I really wish I might have. I wish she'd lived to see all of this excitement and amazing, you know, amazing reactions to that interview. Well, when you consider the fact that so much homophobia is based on religion, and you look back at that interview with Tammy Faye Baker, is there anything you would have said differently or added to what you did say? Oh, wow. Well, sure. You know, I wish that I had said more about the loving nature of many gay and lesbian relationships and how, you know, I wish I'd theologized more about how God is love and for God to condemn somebody's love for another human being is for God to condemn God because God is love. That's an equation. And God condemning God just cannot happen theologically. I wish I'd gotten more into that. And I also wish that I had been able to get more into the near-death experience that I had two weeks prior to it. But I did get to profess my faith in Jesus Christ and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that was the moment at which I think she got it that I was indeed a gay Christian. When you first started doing media interviews in the 80s, I'm told that you were not physically allowed into the studios and you had to do your interviews by video. Is that right? Well, yeah. Uh, a lot of times when I was interviewed in the early 80s as a person with AIDS, they would not let me in the studio because the crew wouldn't work uh, if I came into the studio. There was such fear about how AIDS was transmitted. And they knew better at the time, but the fear was still vibrant and, and prohibitive. And so I, I very often sat in a chair in an alley beside AIDS Project Los Angeles to do these interviews with somebody in a studio a mile away. So I got kind of used to that. And she, she says in the interview, Tammy Faye says in, in the interview that the only reason we didn't have you come here is because we, you're taking chemotherapy. And we didn't, uh, I have since heard from reliable sources that they didn't have me come because they thought I'd be badly treated by employees of the, the staff of Heritage Village, the hotel, and that maybe the camera crew wouldn't work there in, in the PTL studio. So they were afraid I would be treated badly and they didn't want to see that or have that happen to me. I suspected that as well. I want to ask you about the movie, The Eyes of Tammy Faye. It's coming out this fall. I've seen the trailer. It looks like an amazing film. I yeah. think you've said you, have you seen the movie? Yes, I have, yeah. What did, did you, you think of it, Steve? I really liked it. I thought it was a great film, a very exciting biopic. Very, I mean, I've never seen a biopic quite like it, to tell you the truth. Jessica Chastain as Tammy Faye is amazing. She does her own singing. She does a great job of evoking Tammy Faye. She doesn't imitate her, but she evokes her. And, and she looks so much like her in this film. And as she gets older, she looks more and more like her. And apparently she spent hours in the makeup chair every morning to achieve that. And Andrew Garfield is fantastic as, as Jim Baker. Vincent D'Onofrio is great as, uh, as Jerry Falwell. And I really like the fellow who plays me. I thought he was very effective. So, and evoked me. His name was Randy Havens. Did yes. you meet with him to prepare him for the role? No, no, not at all. I didn't know that the film was was in the works until after it was already filmed. It was in post-production when I heard from Jay Baker, Tammy's son, that the film was happening and that my interview was featured prominently in the, in the movie. Um, I mean, it's only a few minutes, so I mean, I don't want to make too, too much of a fuss, but it's a big turning point in the movie. And it's, it's really interesting to see the way they use the interview. 
and they got the essential moments out of the interview in because it's the actual interview was 24 minutes and in the movie it's like you know two or three minutes and uh, so but it it was very effective and i thought randy did a great job i have communicated with him via twitter but only to say hello and and thank you for doing such a great job and um, i've I, jessica and i have also exchanged private tweets but i wrote her an email that was forwarded to her telling uh, how much i appreciated her work as tammy Faye, and uh, i did hear back from michael showalter the director who i also wrote to congratulate on such a great film and he wrote me back this lovely note it was just something i'll always treasure so in 1993 you were invited to a prayer breakfast at the white house with president clinton and vice president gore prior to world aids day can you tell us a little about that experience sure well i went to the white house with 11 other religious leaders in aids ministry we were basically the directors of aids ministry for our individual denominations and because i was the person with aids I was the director of AIDS ministry for the MCC denomination, but I was also the person with AIDS who was out at least at the, at the breakfast. And so I was seated next to Bill Clinton. And what an amazing thing to get to sit and speak truth to power and to you know, be able to speak to him about the issues, the passions of my heart that I felt so... I felt so strongly about the need for education because at the time education was the only vaccine, it still is really, the only vaccine against HIV. Now they have PrEP, of course, but he really liked that line and quoted me the next day in his World AIDS Day speech, which of course my mother recorded faithfully every time it aired on C-SPAN. <laughs> so. When you see how quickly the pharmaceutical industry was able to come up with a vaccine for COVID, does it disappoint you that after 40 years, there's still no vaccine for HIV? Yes and no. I am amazed at how quickly they did come up with a vaccine for COVID. And if, if they could do that now, why didn't that happen for us 40 years ago? And one of the main reasons was because of who got the disease. As far as the government was concerned in the 80s, those of us who had AIDS were, you know, undesirable population, gay men and sex workers and, and uh, you know, um, drug people, users, uh, drug users and, and, and poor people. And, you know, so kill them off. Who cares? You know, it was just kind of appalling how long it took for the leadership of this country to get behind doing AIDS research and, you know, get behind social services and all of that. But uh, they eventually did with uh, Bill Clinton uh, to a certain extent. As you know, Elizabeth Taylor was a high profile AIDS activist. And I believe you met her, didn't you? Yes. Uh huh. I was the I was the person with AIDS who spoke at the very first entertainment industry event raising money for AIDS. And it was a banquet that she threw to give an, an, the Commitment to Life Award to Betty Ford, first former First Lady Betty Ford, for her work. And there were 250 major celebrities there, 1,500 people in the in the ballroom, and. I spoke before all of them. Shirley MacLaine introduced me. And Elizabeth Taylor was just wonderful. She's so real and passionate about AIDS. She was, was uh, and body and fun and down to earth and- And uh, loving. Movie star, and very loving, yeah. And a real movie star. So it was great to meet her. And, and I saw her on any number of occasions because our paths crossed at AIDS benefits and things like that. I, I want to ask you, Steve, you've had near-death experiences. You had an out-of-body experience. With everything you've been through, do you fear death? No, I really don't. I've, I've crossed over, and then these out-of-body experiences I've had, I feel. And I, 
I had such a sense of total peace, total understanding of everything that I'd never understood about myself, about the world, and such a feeling of love all around me, those loving beings there with me in shadows, moving me towards a light, uh, just like you hear a lot of people talk about. But the thing that I remember most was the incredible peace and the knowledge that what really counts is our relationship with each other, our relationships, looking in each other in the eye and seeing each other and reaching deep into each other's souls and touching the hearts of each other. That's what counts at the end. That's what's eternal. Th that's what I found in my near-death death experiences. I had a, a reporter once ask me, well, if they're so great, why do you keep coming back? And I said, because I love life and I don't want to miss anything. And it's true. I just, oh God, I'm so thrilled to still be alive all these years later. Each new birthday is a triumph, you know? <laughs> well, you know, Steve, you're a major icon in the gay community because of your ministry, your altruism, your activism, your inspirational approach to life and faith. You've received many awards, including an honorary doctorate. Are you happy with how your life has turned out? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, my God, yes. I love my life. And I have had so many wonderful moments of real connection with good friends and loved ones and family and, and such wonderful moments of celebration and joy. And, uh, and of course, I've had my losses and my grief. And I mean, you know, the, the losses that we all experienced back in the 80s and 90s, where a third of our more of our friends just died of a disease that I had. And it was appalling. And there, there were some, I, I belong to the Gay Men's Chorus of Los Angeles. And uh, I've sung with them for many, 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 many years. And back before the cocktail treatments, you would see all kinds of IV poles because so many of the Gay Men's Chorus had AIDS. And there were times, there were weeks where we would end the rehearsal with a memorial service for the fellow who died that week. It was just a horrific amount of loss. And I think that a lot of us, even after the cocktail treatments came into effect, a lot of us had a kind of PTSD about all that we went through in the 80s and 90s. I think the rate of alcoholism among us went up. Uh, I think that there was a huge amount of depression with suddenly all these people with AIDS were, who were expecting to die suddenly started getting well. And, oh, my God, now what do I do? I spent all my money. I, I maxed out my credit cards. I, I cashed in my life insurance. Uh, you know, what do I do for a career? I, my career was living with AIDS. And so it was a huge transition. And, I, you know, I, I don't, I've never seen anything like it. And that's what made me so excited about being alive. There's nothing like having AIDS and cancer and seeing so many of your friends and family die to snap you to attention and make you realize the beauty of life and the joy that, that, that there is in life. Well, are you ready for all of the media attention that's about to come your way because of this new movie? I don't know. You know, one of my best friends is Alison Arngren, who played Nellie Olson on the long-running TV series Little House on the Prairie. And we've been friends since she became an AIDS activist in the 80s. And she's getting a big kick out of watching what's happening to me now. because uh, And she's giving me lessons on being famous. Uh, and which is wonderful, you know, so uh, I'm, I don't know that I'm ready, but bring it on, you know, I'll go for the ride. I think it's not out of the realm of possibility that a director will come to you and ask about making a movie about your life. Well, 
that would be amazing. And I, I, I'm just finishing up my memoir. I've, I've begun sending it out. And my memoir begins and ends with the Tammy Faye interview, since that what, that's what seems to be of interest to so many people and tells my story. Uh, and it was what I did during COVID. You know, I, I gave myself the project of writing my memoir, and it was great to have that to do every day. So I'm hoping that my memoir will find a publisher, you know, and will find a literary agent or a publisher or something and get it out there. And maybe somebody will pick it up and a director will say, you know, this needs to be a movie. I yeah. think so. Would you yeah. be willing to come back on our show when the book comes out? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I'd love it, Harvey. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Steve, it's truly been an honor to have you on our show. It was obviously part of God's plan that you become such a beacon of understanding, acceptance, activism, and support. And you've certainly fulfilled that plan beautifully, Steve. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me and my viewers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey. I really appreciate the opportunity. Steve, I wish you continued good health and happiness and success in all of your endeavors and with the book. Thank you again so much for being on our show. Thank you, Harvey. My pleasure. I, I wish you good health and happiness and joy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Our guest has been clergyman and activist, Reverend Stephen Peters. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. All right. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.